Just let Dr. Burks describe what we distributed today. Thank you, Mike. Deborah? Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President. We just want to show you a couple of additional slides, but also to remind all of Americans that we still have a significant number of cases, both in the Boston area and across Massachusetts and Chicago, um, to really that our hearts go out to those cities as they continue to struggle with coronavirus and the consequences at the hospitalization to all the health care providers that are on the front lines. We wanted, um, so these are the, just an illustration of the different types of equipment that are out there, um, describing them both as low speed, but um, quick turnaround time to high speed and taking three to four hours to actually run a hundred or more tests. And so the equipment ranged from all those different, and that's why there's 5,000 of them as noted um, by the president in this list. We wanted every governor and every state and health laboratory director to have a clear understanding of the full capacity within the state both for the capacity, but also where technical assistance and additional supplies may be available. And we were proud to put the federal labs on that list because the military and the VA have stepped up every step of the way to provide support both in testing and care. And we have many military members on the front lines, and I'm sure the military would offer their facilities to the governor of Maryland or any governor who wanted to utilize those to expand testing. So the next slide, I'm just going to run through them very quickly. So every governor not only received the Excel spreadsheet with the complete list of the equipment and the zip code of the location and the laboratory to really be able to create a mosaic of laboratories of the high speed and low speed um, equipment together to meet the needs of their clients, depending if they're drive through or hospital needs. So this is what Florida looks like. Next slide. This is what Louisiana looks like. Next slide. Maryland with significant capacity. Next slide. Virginia with significant capacity throughout the state. Next slide. New York, um, obviously a lot of capacity in New York City um, with overlapping capacity. It's important to know where this is because then it, um, hospitals and labs can support each other when they need surge capacity. Next slide. This is New Jersey. Next slide. Pennsylvania. Next slide. Massachusetts. Next slide. Ohio. Next slide. Oklahoma. Next slide. Washington. Next slide. I think that's uh, Wyoming. So we wanted to show both in states that have large populations and in states that have lower populations, you can see that in general, the number of machines match their population. And we're working with the Walter Reed Group and the American Society of Microbiologists and all the lab directors to really create a web of understanding of what the capacity is currently, what the capacity can be, and how the federal government government can support them in developing their strategies linked to the overarching federal strategy of testing as outlined in our guidelines. Thank you, Thank Mr. You President. Much. Question for Dr. Burst? Yeah. Dr. Burst, um, University of Southern California and the LA County Public Health put out a report today that suggests that the penetrance of the virus is as much as almost 40 times what it was believed to be that as many as 442,000 people in LA County may have been infected which suggests two things. It suggests that you have a lot more people out there who could be spreading the virus, but it also suggests that the case fatality rate is more in line with the 2017-2018 flu than what we've seen in some other areas of the world. But I'm wondering if you've seen that, what your thoughts were. So we're looking at all those studies very carefully, and I think um, you will remember over the last three weeks, I've been talking about the level of asymptomatic spread and my concern about asymptomatic spread, because um, with flu and other diseases, when people are sick, it's easy to contact trace. When people are not sick and shedding virus, you have to have a very different approach, a very different sentinel surveillance approach, a sentinel monitoring approach, which we outlined in the guidelines. And it's why the guidelines took that very seriously. We knew that was unique for respiratory diseases, but it was because we were very concerned about the level of asymptomatic. And if you remember, we used to, we talked about younger age groups may have more asymptomatic disease and your asymptomatic disease may decrease with your uh, out older age groups and that your symptomatic disease might increase with, uh, with age groups. This is still our working hypothesis. We have no data right now still to support that. But it's these kinds of studies that help that. We know that New York 
and Detroit and other cities are very interested, which we want to also support them in testing frontline responders, first responders, and healthcare workers, because we think their exposure may have been the greatest. What we don't want to do, and I'm just going to do another 30 seconds on testing. These tests are not 100% sensitive or specific. And I'm going to go over this over and over again. So if you have 1% of your population infected, and you have a test that's only 99% specific, that means that when you find a positive, 50% of the time it will be a real positive, and 50% of the time it won't be. And that's why we're really asking people to start testing in among the first responders and the healthcare workers and may have had the greatest exposure because that's where the test will be most reliable. And then when we have the luxury, we can go out to broader and broader communities. But this has been the fundamental question to begin with and has been persistent. And we will emphasize to the American people again, this is a highly contagious virus. And we don't know by looking at someone whether they have pre-existing conditions or not. And so all of us, as far as protecting others, must continue to do all of the recommendations to ensure that when we are in an asymptomatic state, we're not passing the virus to others. I have a question for you as well. Uh, the governor of South Carolina announced today they're going to open some stores with restrictions, but they just told my colleague Natasha Chen that they have not achieved that criteria in the White House guidelines about the downward trajectory for 14 days. So shouldn't they not be reopening stores today? We have asked every governor to follow the guidelines, just as we've asked every American to follow the guidelines put out by the president. But each of the governors can decide for themselves whether they've reached specific guidelines in specific areas. I had a question, I think, on Saturday about Jacksonville um, and their beaches. So I did spend about five hours going to every state website. And I will tell you that the Florida Department of Health website is extraordinary. And this is what every Department of Health should have. Because when you go to that website, you can see that most of the cases are in southern Florida, in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Broward County area. And if you look in Jacksonville, they had less than 20 cases per day and less than 800 in four weeks. And so these are the kinds, when you inform the public and give them the information that they need, then they can make decisions along with the local government and governors. So I'm not going to say specifically with South Carolina because I don't know their specific website right now and I don't talk about data unless I've seen it myself. But I know from Jacksonville that they had less than 20 cases a day. And so this is how we need to start informing the community. These websites are critical. It's by zip code and it's by county. They can see cases, they can see cumulative cases, they can see new cases, they can see hospitalizations, they can see mortality, they can see age groups of mortality, and they can see where every testing piece is. This is how we have to inform the American and public, and this is where the American public will develop confidence in each of their counties and local governments. Um, I was hoping you can comment, the Vice President mentioned that there's enough testing capacity right now to proceed to phase one, but what about phase two or phase three? Is there, are there enough machines, are enough cartridges, are there enough reagents right now for the sort of reopening the administration is envisioning taking place over the next month or two? So you can see the current machine outline, and you can see that both of these gentlemen have prepared to have everything ready for phase two and preparing it now for what we will need in the future. And I think that's what you saw with the ventilators. That's what you're seeing with PPE. It's not just for today, it's for tomorrow. And it's our federal planning is not just for this instant. It's making sure that we meet the needs of this instance, but we're planning for 30 and 60 and 90 days ahead. Team, subscribe for more of these type of videos.